The subject of our seventh lecture is conscience. We ended uh, the previous lecture uh, in talking about the uh, two modes of analyzing uh, a uh, moral decision. Uh, the first being uh, looking upon it as the uh, search for means to achieve an end uh, that we desire, and the other uh, associated with the concept of natural law, the application of general rules or principles to a particular uh, situation. And we indicated that uh, while these seem to be rival or quite different uh, modes of analysis, uh, they turn out to be uh, complementary uh, insofar as the principles would be expressive of ends and we can uh, then see that as we would move towards greater and greater proximity to the act, we'd be talking about how that end could be realized or implemented, uh, the means whereby it could be uh, achieved. Uh, just to, parenthetically, it might be noted that uh, the, dis the discussion of weakness of will, remember we, um, we alluded to the Protagoras of Plato uh, as the classical place in which we find uh, someone maintaining, uh, so the Socrates of that dialogue, that knowledge is tantamount to virtue and that if someone knows, really knows what they ought to do, uh, a sign of their really knowing it is that they do it. And if they fail to do the right thing, that's an indication that there's a lack of knowledge. Uh, and in the context of that uh, dialogue, it looks as if the kind of knowledge that's lacking uh, is the sort that Protagoras has come to Athens uh, to teach uh, for a fee. Though it looks as if uh, Plato there uh, is using Socrates uh, to maintain a position uh, which would be itself tantamount to saying that knowledge of moral philosophy uh, assures good action, uh, and that contrary to the uh, remark of uh, Aristotle, that one could become good by philosophizing. Now, I also mentioned that when uh, Aristotle does turn to that discussion, uh, as he does in Book 7 of the Nicomachean Ethics, he doesn't simply dismiss it, because uh, there, is, there is something about uh, the claim that to know what you ought to do uh, it's clear that you know what you ought to do insofar as you do it. Uh, there's something about that that, uh, that is appealing, even though it's, uh, uh, it, uh, there are a lot of counterexamples uh, in our own lives where we knew what we ought to do and, and alas, did, uh, did something quite uh, different. And yet, on the other hand, uh, we do sometimes express shock uh, at the behavior of, uh, of another uh, and someone, let's say, whom we, ha whom we admire or whose position would lead us to be, dis uh, dispo would uh, dispose us to admire them, uh, and they do something awful. And we, we say, don't we, almost spontaneously, how could they do that knowing what they know? How could someone with that knowledge, with that uh, awareness, possibly do uh, what they have done or are uh, accused of? So we seem to uh, vacillate, uh, don't we, between uh, the uh, rejection, almost immediate rejection of the claim uh, that to know the right thing is to do the right thing. And on the other hand, we seem to invoke it ourselves uh, on occasion. Uh, and perhaps that prepares us for Aristotle's uh, balanced uh, response to uh, Plato's claim, uh, and it, it runs along these lines, remember, well, it all depends on what you mean by no. Uh, and Aristotle felt that if you mean knowing in general, if it means knowing principles or rules at some level of generality, uh, that you shouldn't steal, for example, uh, obviously uh, that kind of knowledge doesn't ensure that you won't uh, steal. Uh, but uh, uh, Aristotle says, if we're talking about the knowledge that is embedded in the here and now action, uh, then, the, uh, then the position might have, uh, might have plausibility. Now, what is uh, the, the explanation then of why things go wrong uh, would be the something happening in the transition from the general rule or awareness, I shouldn't steal, to my here and now taking something that belongs to someone else. Uh, what goes wrong here? Is it just that I have a short attention span? Uh, or is there some other explanation uh, of, uh, of my acting badly that turns out to be a version of what Plato wanted to reject uh, as an explanation? Uh, this is what he wanted to reject, that we don't follow what we know because our reason is dragged about by the passion. 
And remember, Plato thought that this was uh, almost a logical impossibility uh, because our, our reason is what is supreme in us and it ought to govern the other uh, capacities and activities in us, such as passions and emotions, uh, rather than the reverse. Well, Aristotle accepting some version of the view uh, that uh, knowledge is virtue, wants it to be the knowledge which is embedded in the action. And of course, then it sounds almost definitionally true uh, that if I know what I'm doing and I, and, uh, and I know uh, correctly what I ought to be doing in a particular situation, then of course my knowledge is, uh, is going to be identical with my, with my action. Uh, but what, what happens in the, in the converse case where we start off, uh, and let's say we're, we're quite clear uh, as to what the moral ideal is, not in just sweeping generality, but uh, in, in certain, uh, say, more or less proximate rules for conduct, uh, and uh, in the event we don't act in accord with that rule. Uh, what, what would be an explanation of that? Now, what, what Aristotle suggests is developed uh, quite a bit by St. Thomas Aquinas uh, in, in this way. Uh, there is a good embodied in the rule. That is, the rule uh, is an expression of what would be a good kind of action, a good way in which to act. Now, the good is, is something which addresses appetite, but here we have knowledge of the good. So Thomas says, here we have a truth about the good. So we're relating to the good not as a good in knowing it, but as uh, some truth that we have about it. This indeed would be an appropriate way for such a being as myself to behave in, say, the area of justice. So we have, we have the expression of a good. Now, when, when we act, what has to happen is that the good which is expressed in knowledge has to connect with my appetite which uh, has the good as its proper object. And what Aristotle suggests happens to us in, in uh, misbehavior is this, that we, and sometimes this can surprise us, we, we can sometimes be surprised by, by the way in which we act, we realize that the good that we acknowledge uh, on reflection and in talking about it at the level of cognition, at the level of some kind of uh, generality, is not our good, that is, our appetite isn't locked onto it. So we're not relating to it as a good. And if we misbehave, what our action will reveal to us, Aristotle suggests, is what our good really is, what our heart really is set on. And then we can find that there is indeed a discrepancy uh, between what we recognize as good when we're discussing it dispassionately or at a level of generality as a matter of knowledge, uh, that what we recognize as good, because it doesn't engage our appetite, is not really our good. And in that sense, we can say that the task, the moral task, is to bring no surprise in, in terms of what we've already said, to bring our appetites in line with our knowledge. That is, our knowledge of what is good has to so impress our appetite that our appetites, our will, our, our emotions are, are locked into that good, the true good. Huh? But in any case, in any case, uh, our appetite is going to, uh, to be uh, aimed at some good, and if it is a good uh, out of uh, tune, uh, in disharmony uh, with our uh, uh, judgment as to what the good is, this is going to show up in action. This is going to show up in action. So Aristotle, in discussing um, uh, moral discourse uh, as, uh, as we would describe it in terms of the application of rules, is saying, in effect, okay, think of it almost as a syllogism. In fact, he does. He suggests we can call it a practical syllogism. And the major premise would be a rule of action of some generality, and the minor premise would be the application of that action to these here and now circumstances. And it's here that things can go wrong uh, if our appetite really isn't locked into the good expressed in the principle that we're trying to apply here, and things we freak out, so to speak, uh, and in doing so, we realize that what we really want is something quite opposite to the good expressed in the uh, 
in the principle. Example, let's say that, that you become a kind of poet of temperance and you can give all kinds of great arguments uh, for moderation and the consumption of alcoholic beverages and so forth, and you're, you become famous, you lecture around the country on it and so forth, and you regularly get bombed. Huh? So there is, there is a, there's a discrepancy between what you recognize at some level uh, as uh, good and where your true good lies, where your heart really is. And that lies somewhere in the direction of never turning down a drink or something like that. Huh? So that in the event when you act and uh, you, you start off with this awareness, uh, you're just uh, uh, fresh back from the lecture circuit, uh, as to the good of moderation for your, for your general moral well-being, and here, an opportunity uh, for more uh, uh, drink than you need or, or uh, than is good for you presents itself and bingo, uh, you, you take it. So it's clear that what your real good is is not the good expressed in the judgment uh, of moderation, but rather uh, never pass up a drink or never uh, fail to titillate your senses or, or what have you. Sometimes this surprises us, as I say, and we, we find uh, under pressure or in circumstances uh, unusual to ourselves that uh, we re were revealed to ourselves in a way that uh, uh, we hitherto had not been because we hadn't been tempted, let's say, in a particular way, and we realize that the goods that we're able to recognize and, uh, and even argue on behalf of on the level of universality have not been appropriated to us. They haven't become our good. And that, again, we could say that is the moral task, uh, to make our, our uh, appetites, our existential orientation one with what we can recognize re uh, with reason uh, as what is good, what is fulfilling uh, of it. Now, when we, when we turn to the subject of conscience, which we'll be developing uh, as we continue uh, in this lecture, what we're going to be talking about here is, um, is uh, a way of applying rules to uh, individual cases. Uh, a conscientious judgment about what I ought to do is, in effect, taking into account the various knowledge that I have as to what one ought to do in such and such circumstances uh, or, or uh, uh, when confronted with a certain difficulty, and then I'm applying, I'm applying that rule to these circumstances here and now. So I'm making a conscientious judgment as to the relevance and applicability uh, of a uh, moral principle to my circumstances here and now. That's, that's the setting for the discussion of uh, conscience, uh, and we'll return to that uh, uh, after a moment. The judgment of conscience, uh, as we were mentioning, is the application to the here and now circumstances in which we find ourselves of a general moral rule. Cardinal Newman uh, had a great deal uh, to say about uh, conscience. It played a great role uh, in his uh, thinking and pondering. Uh, he thought that, uh, in fact, he, he fashioned a kind of proof for the existence of God based on the reality of conscience, uh, feeling that that voice, and he was quite content to use that metaphor of a voice of conscience within us, uh, that whereby we discern between what is good or bad. We're conscious, uh, we're conscious uh, Newman thought, uh, in this uh, judgment of conscience of uh, a voice other than our own. That is, that we're not just making up these rules, we're applying them. Uh, and he thought that uh, reflection on that might very well be a path whereby one might recognize the role of God in, uh, in uh, one's life. He had other things to say about conscience, famous uh, letter to the Duke of Norfolk uh, raising questions about uh, the kind of fealty that a Catholic would owe to, uh, to the Holy Father, uh, and a famous uh, pa remark in that, that uh, if he had to, uh, uh, to propose a toast, uh, Newman said it would be uh, to my conscience first and then to, then to the Pope. Uh, a uh, much quoted and cited remark, uh, not always, I don't think, to the point that Newman was, uh, was making, but nonetheless a famous one. Uh, conscience uh, is, uh, is uh, a uh, topic which uh, the present Holy Father has returned to again and again. It is something which in the uh, Declaration on Religious Freedom, uh, that document of, of Vatican II, comes very much to the fore. Uh, that there's something just reprehensible in trying to force the conscience of another or to force a free judgment uh, on the part of another person. There's something, as you can see, logically uh, contradictory uh, about a forced free uh, action. So this, this notion that uh, we have a moral obligation uh, to, uh, to uh, acknowledge and to honor 
uh, the consciences of others is something which uh, is not a new doctrine, but it certainly has been uh, emphasized more in recent times than it had been uh, before. Uh, Yet I think uh, it's possible for us to, uh, to uh, invoke conscience uh, maybe a little too hastily or as if it were always a stopper. If we think, for example, of two soldiers uh, on the same battlefield and confronting, let's say, the same enemy advance, uh, and one of them decides at a given point that he should shoot and the other does not, uh, here we would have very, let's say, two very different conscientious judgments uh, as to what action would be appropriate. Uh, and we're, each of them uh, would, would, would simply be following his own conscience, and it's rather difficult or rather impossible uh, for anyone else really to pry into uh, those uh, uh, psyches, those uh, consciousness, consciousnesses, and uh, to appraise what's going on. But we would honor, well, yes, knowing what you know and applying it as you did in those circumstances, even very similar circumstances, you could have a different action, a different uh, judgment. Uh, so there is a sense in which uh, we do tend to acknowledge that an appeal to one's conscience, uh, that ultimate judgment as to what one ought to do, is a stopper. Uh, and uh, we simply acknowledge, well, yeah, you've got to, you, you've got to follow that uh, judgment. But we should, I think, notice this, and uh, it's something that uh, dawned on me uh, somewhat uh, belatedly, uh, because Thomas, when he talks about conscience, Thomas Aquinas, uh, will, uh, will emphasize its being this proximate judgment, the last and most proximate judgment uh, for action, very particular application uh, of, our, of our moral knowledge. Uh, and that can obscure the fact that he, like we, uh, uses conscience in uh, a quite a different way as well. That is, when we, when we talk about a uh, malformed or erroneous conscience, we're not talking about a here and now application. We're talking about, no doubt, the set of, uh, of moral rules and principles, the moral knowledge that we have at some level of, uh, of generality. And very often, I think, uh, people invoke conscience in this sense as if it were a stopper. Uh, for example, it's not unusual uh, to uh, be told by someone that, well, their conscience tells them that, let's say, contraception, for example, is morally okay. Uh, and oftentimes that's, uh, that's introducible. Well, that's the end of the discussion. I mean, if their conscience tells them that and your conscience tells you something different, well, you're just going to have to live with the, uh, uh, with the different. Uh, that won't do because uh, if one is saying that his conscience tells him that uh, contraception is okay, that's a general statement. Uh, and as a general statement, it's one that's discussable and one wants to know in virtue of what uh, do you come to the conclusion that that's an okay, that's a permissible, uh, more illicit mode of action for, uh, for human beings. Then uh, one owes oneself, at least, uh, an answer to that kind of question. It can't simply be like having freckles or something and say, my conscience tells me uh, that, uh, let's say, wiping out the innocent in uh, large numbers uh, is, is okay to do. And if yours tells you something else, well, there you are. But we wouldn't, we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't accept that. So let's let's distinguish between conscience uh, in terms of general rules and a kind of uh, uh, theoretical uh, notion that we have about a kind of action on the one hand, uh, and the here and now application of that knowledge uh, 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 as the proximate rule for action, the judgment uh, of conscience. This, this uh, is a, an important distinction to make, I think, because one thing we would, uh, we would want to insist upon with uh, Thomas Aquinas and, and the whole tradition on this matter uh, is that our conscience binds us. We're bound to follow our conscience. And to some degree, this is true of conscience in, the both, in, in both senses. Uh, obviously, our last and most proximate judgment uh, in these circumstances of what we ought to do, that is, what is the good thing to do uh, in these circumstances, that's what we ought to do. That's what we ought to do. Not to do that would be, in effect, not to do the right thing or to do the wrong thing. So uh, it is, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, pretty uh, easy to argue uh, that one is bound to follow his conscience. Uh, in terms of the proximate rule of action. Uh, and so too with respect to the present state of one's moral knowledge. Huh? Uh, if uh, for whatever reason one has, on reflection, let's say, or 
whatever uh, uh, means one has arrived at this. One thinks that uh, contraception is okay, to continue with that example, uh, well then to act on that knowledge is, is what's called for. And to act contrary to it would be to indicate, and to think you were doing the right thing, would be to indicate that you didn't really hold uh, what you claim to uh, have held uh, in, in the first place. So in either case, uh, but certainly in the case of the uh, conscientious judgment, uh, it, is, it is a feature of traditional discussions of these matters that we are bound to follow our conscience, that we are bound to follow, we're obliged to follow our conscience. Now this, this of course, uh, uh, um, gives rise to uh, a bit of a paradox, uh, and it may remind you of our earlier discussions of emotivism. Uh, emotivism, you remember, was the view that a moral judgment is simply an expression of one's subjectivity, of one's feelings, of one's emotion. And consequently, uh, uh, we drew this consequence from it. If that were the case, if moral judgments were uh, simply the expression of my feelings, uh, then uh, it, would, um, it would appear that moral disagreement and moral agreement uh, are impossible, that they're equally impossible. Um, for this reason, that uh, a moral judgment we suggested then would sound a good deal like uh, a report of having a pain uh, and uh, someone saying that they don't have the pain uh, that you're talking about. I have, uh, my example was lower back pain, a uh, little autobiography there, and I say I feel lower back pain, and uh, you say I don't, uh, those are perfectly compatible. We're not disagreeing. Huh? Uh, and if you say I do too, you're not agreeing with me. I mean, your report on your lower back pain is not identical with my report on my lower back pain. So uh, in, in either case, it would look as if uh, agreement uh, is uh, impossible and disagreement is impossible if indeed moral judgments were expression of one's emotions or subjectivity. And now we get to the notion of conscience, and it looks as if after a long detour through uh, discussions meant to show uh, that there are objective criteria for determining whether or not something is good or bad uh, conduct for a human being, that we're guided here by natural law, which is a participation in the eternal law, so that the good action uh, can be expressed as action which is in conformity with the uh, eternal uh, law. After all that, it looks as if we're coming back now to a very subjective kind of position and saying, well, in any case, you've got to follow your conscience. Huh? And if our consciences are giving us very different uh, judgments, uh, it's, let's say, uh, about a certain mode of conduct, uh, how could they be said to be in conflict if you're reporting on your conscience and I'm reporting on mine? Uh, this is, as you appreciate, a, an extremely serious problem uh, within the uh, tradition. Uh, and if it were simply left here, uh, it would be an insoluble problem, and what we would have here is something very much akin uh, to uh, emotivism. Uh, so, but here it is. Whatever your conscience tells you, you are obliged to do. Your conscience might tell you to do something very different from what my conscience tells me to do, and yet we're both obliged to follow our conscience. From this, someone might conclude that finally the goodness or badness of human actions is determined by a subjective disposition and we could get very different readings from one subjectivity uh, as opposed to another subjectivity with the, again, to, uh, uh, to uh, repeat it, uh, uh, to end in something very much like uh, emotivism. Is that, what, is that what we're left with here? Um, if it is the case, that our conscience always obliges us, if we are obliged to follow the conscience that is ours, that is our best judgment of what is the right thing to do, nonetheless, the tradition states, we are not exonerated or excused by following an erroneous conscience. So you can see in, in, included in this uh, is the notion that the conscience that we have formed, that is objectively speaking, not all consciences are equal. That is, we can be mistaken uh, in our judgment as to what is good and what is bad to do. While we have those judgments, we're stuck with them and we have to, we have to follow them. But the question can arise as to how we formed that conscience. 
Uh, and when one is calling it an erroneous uh, conscience, uh, or speaking of an erroneous conscience, clearly what is implied is that you can have a malformed conscience. You can judge that something is good that isn't good for human beings to do. Or you might think uh, that something that's perfectly all right to do uh, is wrong to do. And as long as you think that, then, uh, then you would have to follow that knowledge. If you thought playing cards, let's say, was uh, just dreadfully sinful, then you would be obliged to follow that, uh, even though it's a, it's, a dubious, uh, it's a dubious moral rule. Uh, so it works both ways. You might uh, wrongly think that uh, something that is uh, morally r uh, bad is okay to do, and you might think that something that's morally okay is morally bad to do. Uh, in either case, you have an erroneous conscience, but while you have it, you have to follow it. You're obliged to follow it. If it is an erroneous conscience that uh, uh, is is, uh, has been formed, then the question has to arise as to how you formed that conscience. And when we look into that, it might very well uh, turn out that while you have to follow it, you're doing wrong in following it. And there's a real paradox, which we'll return to in a moment. Well, we ended with a, with a uh, paradox indeed, uh, where one, uh, we could imagine a situation on the basis of what we were discussing, uh, where someone would be obliged to follow a conscience which is erroneous, and in doing so would do wrong, uh, would, uh, would do an evil act, and would be held responsible for it as evil. Uh, this uh, looks like a moral dilemma to, uh, to end all moral dilemmas. Uh, and uh, it is sometimes thought to, uh, uh, to, to put one uh, in a situation, it, in fact it looks to be a situation where no matter what one does, he does the wrong thing. If one fails to follow his conscience, he's obliged to do it, then he does the wrong thing because his conscience is telling him to do one thing and he's doing the opposite. If he does follow an erroneous conscience under certain uh, circumstances that we'll be talking about now, uh, then for him to follow that conscience is to do a wrong thing. So that is, uh, that's a very perplexing and paradoxical situation. Uh, the only way in which uh, it can, it can uh, clar be clarified for us is to see that one looking at uh, the erroneous conscience would, uh, would come to the conclusion that one is responsible for having formed that conscience. Uh, is responsible uh, for the ignorance, in effect, which is involved in thinking that something that is uh, right is wrong or something that is wrong is right. Uh, at a certain age or with certain opportunities, one is obliged to know just what is the case. Uh, one, one is uh, obligated uh, to form uh, a, a, correct, uh, a correct conscience just as we say in the law, that everyone has an obligation to know the law. Uh, so too here, we could uh, put it uh, in um, perhaps stern terms, uh, that everyone uh, is obliged to, uh, to know the moral law, and that is uh, to form a conscience. This is conscience, obviously, in the, uh, in the sense of uh, general knowledge uh, as to types of acts or kinds of acts which are, which are good or uh, bad. So the dilemma is not quite as, uh, as stark as it seemed. Uh, one can change his conscience huh? uh, so that uh, it is possible for one to escape the dilemma of being obliged to follow a conscience, which if he does follow it, he's going to do the wrong thing. And if he doesn't follow it, he's going to do the wrong thing. Uh, it is possible for one to, uh, to take the measure of his conscience and ask, uh, and circumstances could very well uh, suggest uh, to one that uh, uh, it's worth looking into uh, how he came to think that certain things are right or wrong. Uh, for a Catholic, of course, the guidance of the church in the formation of a conscience is a very precious uh, kind of auxiliary to, uh, to uh, one's own uh, general ruminations on what's uh, right and wrong. Uh, so that uh, here, if a Catholic, of course, found himself maintaining something as okay, uh, which is very clearly uh, uh, stated to be not okay by the magisterium of the church, uh, he, that should give him very serious pause. Uh, and uh, he's, he's in uh, a kind of meta dilemma there. It would be rather extraordinary uh, if the, uh, if the uh, 
instrument uh, for the uh, continuation of the gospel in the world and for the uh, correct interpretation of the good news should be saying one thing and I should be saying something quite different. Uh, that ought to, as I say, give me pause and to uh, make me wonder, well, how is it that I thought uh, that, for example, contraception was all right? Uh, this is an example that leaps to one's mind because uh, there's been such a rash of people uh, who uh, uh, tend to want to think that they will just have a view on this matter that's not the official uh, church position, and somehow that's okay because they're following their own conscience. Huh? Well, the question would be, well, what do you mean by your conscience, your best judgment uh, as to what is right or wrong? Uh, isn't it rather extraordinary that in a matter like this, you're coming up with a judgment which is at variance uh, with the uh, body, which, as I say, has as its office uh, the preservation and, uh, and dissemination of sound doctrine uh, for a uh, Christian. So in the formation of a conscience, uh, certainly a Catholic has, has a tremendous advantage uh, in uh, getting right guidance as to uh, what is right and, and, uh, and what is wrong. Uh, just as uh, Christians generally, uh, 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 believers in the book will turn uh, to the Bible for uh, guidance as to what a person ought to do. Uh, and uh, very often, of course, what we're, what we're uh, being told about are not just things that apply to people who are religious believers, but things that apply to anyone whatsoever, to any human being. The most uh, obvious example of that would be uh, the Decalogue. Uh, God delivers uh, the law to Moses on Mount Sinai and he brings it down. He brings it down twice, uh, engraved on tables, uh, reminding uh, the chosen people uh, that they shouldn't steal, they shouldn't lie, they shouldn't uh, take one another's wives, spouses, uh, and uh, they shouldn't murder. Uh, we wouldn't think of this as moral news uh, as, uh, as a rule. And yet the chosen people, like ourselves, uh, can, by dint of uh, actions of a certain kind, blind, uh, we can blind ourselves to the most obvious natural moral truths. It's not just Jews, the chosen people, uh, who shouldn't kill. It's not just the chosen people who shouldn't lie. Anyone uh, is bound by, uh, by the commandments, by what uh, was revealed or was given to, uh, to Moses on Mount Sinai. This was not special news. This was ordinary news. Uh, we might say general uh, information about how human beings ought to act. And yet it is possible for us to wander away even from the most obvious moral truth. Uh, and here we see the tremendous, uh, the tremendous uh, value uh, of revelation. The revelation, the Bible, doesn't just tell us about things that we wouldn't have known otherwise, supernatural truths, although that is its main function, but uh, it also tells us, uh, reinforces uh, the truths that we should know independently of revelation. So that uh, it is a, a kind of fact, I think, of modern life, uh, that we see that the natural morality uh, things that are binding on anyone, believer or not, seem to have uh, as their primary custodian and champion the Catholic Church. Uh, this pope and previous popes have of often noted that uh, the Church has the, is the custodian of the natural law as well as the new law, the supernatural law, uh, in the sense of, uh, of giving a sanction for it, not in the sense that it's binding on Catholics and on no one else, but simply in the mode of uh, the tablets of the law that Moses brought down from Mount Sinai, a reminder and a powerful underpinning uh, of natural knowledge of, uh, of what we uh, ought to do. All one need do is to ask oneself uh, who uh, in the contemporary world uh, would be a reinforcer uh, for such obvious principles as that children ought not to be uh, killed in the womb uh, uh, or that uh, people ought not to be hastened to their death because they're an inconvenience and, uh, and the like. We find in the culture around us uh, a terrible loss of the most obvious uh, moral principles, and if the church weren't reminding us of those, as I say, who would be? Uh, so uh, it, would be, um, it would be very wrong here uh, insofar as we distinguish between the natural and the supernatural to think that everything would be kind of hunky-dory in the natural order and that the supernatural order just adds 
things onto that onto that uh, well operating uh, area, uh, and um, uh, it's just sort of a simple plus. Uh, what de facto is the case is that uh, it's the supernatural order that, that restores and reinforces the natural, uh, so much so that uh, we can imagine that without grace, uh, as, as Thomas uh, says in uh, another of his works, uh, the human race would be living in the worst kind of darkness and bestiality and so forth. Uh, and we get intimations of that, certainly, in our own times, and I don't just mean in other people or in the society around us. Uh, we, get to, we get some sense of uh, what we and what the world is like without uh, the powerful reinforcing of the natural by the supernatural. Evelyn Waugh, the, uh, the writer, uh, uh, had uh, his uh, personal flaws and uh, faults and was rather impatient and brusque uh, with people. Uh, and this, uh, this uh, alarmed or this uh, angered, let's say, uh, a friend of his, a woman, and uh, she said, how in the world can you act the way you do and call yourself a Catholic? And Waugh said, can you imagine what I would be like if I weren't one? Huh? So that uh, it's an imperfect, let's say, reinforcement uh, uh, religious belief uh, of the natural. But uh, if we imagine it taken away entirely, uh, we, can, we can imagine a very grim scene. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the imagination is, uh, is aided, as I say, by the intimations we can get looking around us uh, at the extraordinary things which just over the course of my lifetime have passed from being universally recognized as, as horrible uh, and uh, such that anyone who engaged in them would be ostracized from society, abortion, uh, to being talked about as if it were some kind of a blow for liberty and freedom and, uh, and just a wonderful uh, boon uh, for uh, people uh, generally. That's an extraordinary, that's an extraordinary alteration uh, of, uh, of moral consciousness, of let's say the collective conscience uh, of, uh, of, a, of a people. So in formulating our moral knowledge, in, uh, in uh, acquiring the inventory that we have of what we ought to do and what we ought not to do, of course we're influenced by our parents, by our upbringing, by our culture and so forth. And this can be a mixed blessing uh, depending on, on how reliable uh, those sources of uh, moral knowledge are. But uh, to have to have the church, uh, to have the uh, supernatural order, to have revelation there as a measure uh, and the calling back, even as I say, to those natural rules for human action, uh, which by and large all of the precepts of the Decalogue are, uh, is an inestimable uh, advantage and one uh, for which we, uh, we, we should be uh, grateful. Another instance, I think, of, of uh, what I uh, was speaking of earlier in terms of the issue of Christian philosophy, uh, the way in which the faith uh, is a kind of ambience uh, within which the natural as natural can flourish. And without this ambience, it seems to wither away uh, and to get lost. Uh, so too, philosophy uh, in the ambience of the faith should flourish as philosophy. But of course, if it does, the arguments uh, ought to be such that they are convincing to one who does not share uh, the uh, presuppositions of that ambience, uh, namely the faith. And the point of natural law is, and of conscience as Newman uh, speaks of it, is that everyone has the wherewithal to discern good and evil. So even if we should have been badly brought up, even apart from the availability of revelation in principle, we have the uh, capacity to distinguish good from evil. Thomas always quotes Psalm 4 uh, in this regard, uh, in the Latin, of course, uh, uh, where the psalmist is asking, who will show us what is good? And the answer, as Thomas says, comes forth, signatum es super nos lumen vultus tui domine. Huh? The light of thy countenance is sealed upon us, O Lord. It's as if Again, we have a participation in us of eternal law, which gives us rules for conduct and this capacity for discerning good uh, from uh, evil. In uh, talking about conscience, I'm reminded of the uh, prologue to the uh, first part of the second part of the Summa, in which Thomas gives an account of what is meant by saying that man is made in the image of God. Uh, I translated it in this book, Ethica Domestica, so I'll, uh, let me just read it to you in this uh, impeccable translation. 
Uh, because, as Damascene writes, man is said to be made in the image of God, insofar as image connotes intellectual, free of will, and master of oneself, having spoken of the exemplar, namely of God, he's locating this part of the Summa, having, having spoken of the exemplar, namely of God, and of those things which proceed from him according to his divine power and will, that's part one of the Summa, there remains for us to consider his image, that is man, insofar as he is the source of his own deeds as having free will and mastery of what he does. First Thomas goes on, we must consider the ultimate end of human life and then those things through which man can either attain this end or deviate from it. From the end are derived reasons for things ordered to it. Since the ultimate end of human life is said to be happiness, we must first consider happiness. You can see how I've been following that, uh, that pattern in uh, what, I've been, uh, what I've been saying. But it, it's a kind of summary statement. What uh, human dignity uh, principally resides in is this capacity we have to direct our own lives, to act responsibly, to mm -hmm. see the good and, uh, and to do it. Uh, and uh, we acknowledge uh, uh, this uh, capacity in others, even even when, as we can see, they're doing the wrong thing. You can't uh, you can't force uh, someone's conscience. We can, of course, uh, and we do in civil society. Uh, if someone thinks it's okay to take a uh, a uh, uh, an automatic weapon and go down to the mall and just sort of practice uh, as people are going by, we tend to uh, restrain them and take away the weapon and maybe take away their freedom uh, at the same time. So it's not as if we say, well, he's, uh, he's uh, got the dignity of a human being and he can follow his own conscience and so forth. There are limits uh, to that. Uh, but fundamentally, uh, it, is, uh, it is the way in which we acknowledge uh, the dignity of other persons by seeing in them uh, an agent who has dominion over his own acts, who is responsible. Of course, we might say that's why, uh, that's why uh, we, uh, we can honor uh, someone who uh, does the sort of uh, deed that I've just mentioned uh, by giving them, uh, showing them the courtesy of uh, assuming that he did it deliberately uh, and that he is responsible, answerable for it, uh, and uh, holding him accountable is a way of, uh, of observing uh, his dignity as one who has dominion uh, over his own uh, actions. Now, one puzzle uh, uh, that can arise with respect to uh, conscience in the sense of the uh, immediate rule of action, the conscientious judgment of what I ought to do here and now, as opposed to the generalized knowledge I might have of what one ought to do in circumstances of a sort, is this. Uh, you remember that when I was talking about um, moral discourse as the application of uh, general rules to the here and now situation as a prelude to talking about conscience. Uh, I wanted to recall to you uh, the discussion of, um, of uh, uh, the Protagoras of Plato of uh, weakness of will. How is it that in making this application uh, we, we uh, are deviated from it? We go off and do something very, uh, that doesn't fall under the rule, let's say, from which we began. Uh, and I suggested that this reveals to us where our heart really lies, that uh, our good is not the good that is expressed in the principle, that we are related to the good as a true, as a truth, but not as good, to the good as good, because to relate to the good as good is to be pursuing it, uh, to, be, uh, to be existentially connatural with it, uh, as Thomas Aquinas uh, uh, puts it. And then I went on and talked about conscience. Now, you can see the difficulty. Um, how is it possible on the basis of that analysis of how things go wrong, how is it possible for us to come down to a very proximate singular judgment of what I ought to do if my disposition is, uh, uh, let's say, out of kilter uh, with the good expressed in the, in the principle? Uh, and Thomas uh, takes up this uh, discussion in terms of a, a contrast between what he calls the, uh, the judgment of conscience on the one hand and the judgment of free will on the other. And the way in which he, he uh, uh, expresses the difference is this. The judgment of conscience, even this very particular singular judgment here and now where I'm about to act and, I, and I'm aware I shouldn't do this, huh? 
So it's not just a generalized sort of thing, one ought not to do this sort of thing, but here I am and I say, I, I shouldn't do this. Huh? What's a nice person like me doing in a situation like that? So I, it's, it's very proximate. Huh? Uh, and yet uh, it, looks, uh, it looks as if uh, this is the very sort of thing that uh, I'm being told uh, by the previous analysis, I'm not going to be able to bring off if my appetite is uh, out of kilter with the uh, good again expressed in the, in the general principle. The way Thomas distinguishes what he calls the judgment of freedom, uh, which is uh, affected by my appetitive disposition, uh, and the judgment of conscience is by saying, the judgment of conscience is one of pura cognitio. Uh, it is, it's, uh, you don't emphasize the last uh, vowel in Latin, the pura cognitio. Uh, it's pure knowledge. Huh? It's pure knowledge. It, uh, it does not engage the appetite. So th this leads him then to make a distinction about uh, the judgment of conscience. Uh, and if we think of it, first of all, in terms of retrospective conscience, huh? You've, you've done something and now you're reflecting on it, maybe immediately afterwards or sometime later, uh, and you get this sinking, remorseful feeling that you did the wrong thing. And this is a very different uh, judgment about that particular action. Now, you're not just talking about things in general, but I should not have done that. And uh, alas, this is an experience we've all had. Remorse, huh? Ag and bite of inwit. Uh, this, is, uh, this is something we all recognize. So there is a reflective, retrospective conscience uh, that judges uh, that that action was wrong. Now, when you think about that, the difference between the situation in which one performs the action and the situation in which, in which one reflects on the action uh, is that you would be untroubled by emotion or passion, let's say, in this retrospect, uh, retrospective judgment. And that's, that's a way of getting hold, I think, of what Thomas must mean by saying this is a purely cognitive judgment, the judgment of uh, conscience, whereas the judgment of free will uh, is, is inevitably caught up with our appetitive disposition. Uh, so too now, if we, if we take prospective uh, conscience, uh, which is the way we've been talking about it up until now, what should I do, uh, projecting into the future, I think what Thomas must be saying is that there is a moment before our appetite is effectively engaged when we are applying our general knowledge to these circumstances. But that isn't, uh, that isn't the, the judgment that is embedded in the action. Huh? Where there is a discrepancy, between the judgment of conscience and what I actually do, and what I actually do. If uh, one's, uh, if one's uh, conscientious judgment is simply followed, uh, then of course one's appetite is in tune with the good that uh, is being applied uh, by uh, the uh, process uh, uh, of, of conscience, and there's no conflict. So we wouldn't then distinguish uh, between my best judgment of what I ought to do and my doing it. It's when there is, uh, I, I, I say, uh, I, I know that here and now I, I ought not, it's probably going to sound that way, I ought not do this, and then I go on and do it, uh, that uh, one can see that that prior judgment, however uh, temporarily prior it would be, is one that is not yet affected by my appetitive disposition. And that's why Thomas calls it one of, uh, of uh, pure knowledge. It's a bit of a, uh, a, bit of a uh, wrinkle in his, uh, in his moral thought because it's possible for us to, uh, to, uh, uh, to derive from uh, a fast reading of what he's saying uh, that uh, you're never going to be able to see your circumstances in their true light unless your disposition is appropriate. Huh? Uh, the judgment of conscience is, uh, is uh, counter to that uh, as, a, as a big generalization. But the other thing is, uh, is an abiding uh, theme of moral philosophy in the tradition that we're sketching and uh, uh, giving introductory lectures to, that really, really, uh, to see what we ought to do uh, in these circumstances depends upon our being well disposed appetitively uh, to the good that is uh, expressed in the rules that we are applying. Uh, that's a very roundabout way of saying what Thomas would put in this way. In order to make the right judgment about what I ought to do here and now, and an effective right judgment about what I ought to do here and now, I must be in possession of the moral virtues. 
Uh, it is uh, one who has the virtue of moderation, who quickly responds to reason's judgment as to what the demands of moderation temperance are in these circumstances. It is the one who has the virtue of courage, who responds promptly uh, to reason's judgment as to what courage requires in, in these circumstances. It is one who has the virtue of justice, who responds quickly to the judgment of reason as to what justice requires in these circumstances. So that right action, good action, presupposes the moral virtue, presupposes that one is disposed to the good, and then there is a straightaway uh, kind of uh, action. There's no agony, there's no uh, vacillation between, well, on the one hand this and on the one hand that. This is why uh, Aristotle described the virtuous person uh, as one for whom good action is a delight, uh, for whom not to act well would be painful. Just as for the vicious person, a vicious action becomes pleasurable, uh, and the notion of acting well is reprehensible. Most of us, Aristotle suggests, are in between there someplace. Uh, if, we, if we recognize what the good is, alas, we may not do it. Huh? Uh, he calls this the incontinent man, uh, perhaps an unfortunate term. Uh, and um, in uh, the case where somebody knows the right thing and manages to do it, but not without gr a great deal of conflict, that sounds like most of us, I suppose, most of the time. That's what Aristotle means by the continent man. Uh, one who manages to do the, the, the right thing, but his whole being is not yet identified uh, with the good that is exemplified uh, in, those, in those principles. When one is uh, in possession of the moral virtues, when the goods recognized by, reasons are, by reason are my good, uh, then you have what Thomas Aquinas called a connaturality, a connaturality uh, with the end. And it's in this case that uh, in a famous passage at the beginning of the Summa, uh, he distinguishes two kinds of wisdom uh, about the uh, practical order. And one is one that might be possessed by someone who is, let's say, uh, studies hard in medical ethics and so forth, and he's good theoretically, and we would tend to go to him to ask, well, what about this procedure? What do you think about this? Is this on the one hand, and then on the other, uh, someone who may not have that theory, but whose whole life and practice has been oriented and manifested in virtuous actions uh, of a kind. That person's judgment as to what we ought to do if we sought her advice would be very proximate. What I would do is what she would say, whereas the other would uh, tend to uh, give you a kind of generalized uh, reason, connatural knowledge. So these, uh, these uh, few thoughts on conscience and the judgment of uh, freedom. Next time we'll be talking about the three fonts of morality.